Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another ARA Monthly Webinar Wednesday. Today's program, Evaluation of Pavement Performance and Condition Using Numerical Simulation, will be presented by Dr. Zafal Khan, who I'll introduce in a few minutes. We hope everybody had a joyous and a blessed Thanksgiving holiday, but it's time to get back to work. It's my pleasure to introduce my new young colleague, Dr. Zafal Khan. Zafal has just recently defended his PhD thesis earlier this month, so that's very recent, at the University of New Mexico. Zafal, fortunately for ARA, has accepted a staff civil engineering position with ARA's Research and Technology Deployment Group. He has experience in non-destructive evaluation and numerical modeling related to pavements, his experience in field instrumentation, nanochemical characterization of pavement materials, and finally, machine learning. Now with that, I'd like to turn the program back over to Zaffel to educate us on the topic of his selection. Thank you, Jerry, uh, for the introduction. Let me start with the outline for today's uh, presentation. At the beginning, I'll have introduction, and then, I'll talk about two topics, evaluation of pavement thickness and condition using ground penetrating radar and multi modeling of asphalt concrete pavement. At the end, based on these two topics, I'll have some conclusions. So let's start. We all know asphalt concrete is a heterogeneous material. It has aggregate phase, mastic, and binder. And if we want the material property of these three phases, we have to perform separate tests. To determine the material property of the bulk asphalt concrete, we have to perform dynamic modulus tests. To determine the material property of the mastic or binder phase, that is non-aggregate phase, we have to perform dynamic shear geometer test. Now, regardless of the number of tests that you do to determine these phase properties, the question is, can you use them in pavement analysis or in pavement design? The short answer to this question is no, because currently available pavement analysis method only considers the bulk properties. So we do not have the way to understand how the phase properties affects the bulk response or in turn, the loading in the actual pavement affects the phase properties. So what can we do? Instead of performing different tests that I have shown in the previous slide, we can perform a single test to determine the phase properties of asphalt concrete and use those phase properties in a multi-scale model to obtain the pavement response. However, the question now becomes, how good is the predicted response compared to the response that we observe in the field? To answer that, as I have already showed in the previous slide, we have to develop a multi-scale model where we will have the actual pavement, the macro scale model, where we will apply the load. And there will also be a micro model where we will define the individual phase properties. And we will be using finite element method to solve this problem. Hence the name multi-scale finite element model. To develop such model, we will need some properties. We will need geometric properties and mechanical properties. And that sets the tone for today's webinar presentation. So at first, I will demonstrate a methodology to determine the thickness and dilatic constant from the back calculation of GPR data which is based on finite difference time domain and machine learning. 
And once we have the thickness and add the constant, we can proceed with the development of a multi-scale pavement model to study the response and damage in the individual phases of asphalt concrete. So let's look into the pavement thickness and condition evaluation using GPR. Here is a schematic of a pavement which has two layers. You can see we have thickness and dielectric constant for each of these layers defined. Now if, you, if we allow a GPR wave to propagate through this pavement, we will have some reflections and the reflections will be collected by the GPR receiver. And if we look at the reflected signal, we will have a scan something like this. This is called an A scan. And as you can see, there are some peaks and associated time information. Using this equation, where we have time, dielectric constant, and thickness, we can determine the thickness of the layer. But there are some assumptions. And the assumption is that for a particular layer, dielectric constant remains same, and it only changes when the layer changes. It is true if the layer of asphalt concrete is relatively thin, but in interstate highway, what happens is that the layers are built in multiple lifts. So for those conditions, we have to verify this assumption. Let's look at the simulation of uh, GPR wave through these uh, three pavements. So each of these pavement has two layers, layer one and layer two, but layer one has multiple lifts. In pavement one, these lifts have same dielectric constant, but for pavement two and pavement three, there are variation in dielectric constant. And for the simulation of GPR wave, we have used an open source program called GPR Max. Now, once we simulate the GPR wave through these uh, three pavements, we will have some A scan similar to the one that I have shown in the previous slide. So here is the A scan that we have. You can see for pavement one, so you can see for pavement one, we have uh, two peaks, only two peaks, at the beginning and at the end. And these two peaks are from the pavement surface and interface between layer one and layer two. In between, we do not have any peaks. But that is not true for pavement two and pavement three, where we have the intermediate peaks. And we can see these intermediate peaks become taller and further apart from each other as we have more variation in the dielectric constant in layer one. And this is a screenshot of a GPR analysis program called Radon. And here you can see there are faint white lines in the asphalt concrete layer. And these faint white lines are multiple lifts. And these faint white lines appear here because there are intermediate uh, peaks. And we have seen that these intermediate peaks only occur when you have some variation in the dielectric constant. So let's recall from the previous slide this equation to determine the thickness of uh, pavement layers. So if you only use the time information to determine the thickness, but do not consider the variation in dielectric constant in the different lifts of a particular layer, then your accuracy, that the, uh, the thickness accuracy that uh, you will be having will be lower. So what can we do to consider this uh, dielectric constant and thickness at the same time for the analysis of the GPR data without any kind of additional step? 
For that, we have developed a finite difference time domain and machine learning based back calculation algorithm to determine the thickness and dilatic constant at the same time without any additional step. And our back calculation method has a two step. In the step one, we perform surrogate optimization on some selected A scans from the field GPR data, and we select those scans randomly. And in the step two, based on the results from the surrogate optimization, we train a neural network and apply it in the actual uh, GPR data to determine thickness and direct constant. But before I talk about uh, in detail about this back calculation method, we have to perform the GPR, right? So to perform GPR, we have uh, used an uh, instrumented pavement section located on an interstate highway where we perform this uh, GPR, particularly on I-40. And we have used air coupled, two gigahertz air coupled antenna. And these are the scanning parameters. Now once we have the GPR data, let's look into the back calculation method. The first step of the back calculation method is surrogate optimization. So in surrogate optimization, as I have uh, previously briefly mentioned, that uh, we randomly select some A scans from the field data. And we use surrogate optimization to predict the properties for those randomly selected scans. So you see, once we perform the optimization, we have a table something like that. And by properties, I mean thickness and dilatic constant associated with each individual A scans. So we have a table of properties. And from that table, we can determine the average value and the standard deviation. And from the average value and the standard deviation, and with an assumption of normal distribution, we can generate an informed synthetic database. But before I talk about what we do with this informed synthetic database, let me look at a particular scan and see how the optimization did. So for a particular location, you can see that after the optimization, we have a good agreement between the simulated A scan and actual GPR A scan, both in time domain and frequency domain. And as the name suggests, it's an optimization problem, so we need to have an objective function. And for this step in the objective function, we have not only considered the peak values, but also their associated time. Now in the previous slide, we performed surrogate optimization, determined uh, the average value and the standard deviation. And with that, we generated an informed synthetic database. Now we can use that informed synthetic database to train the neural network. But before you do that, you have to know the optimum structure of the neural network. And there are several ways you can find the optimum structure. And for this study, we have used trial and error method. And here you can see a snippet of the architecture that we have considered. And for the performance metrics, we have not only considered time and the percentage, but also the overfitting and the underfitting of the data. And once we have considered all these metrics and different neural network structure, we have found that for the database that we have, a three-layer uh, neural network with a, a neural network with three hidden layers and five, five, ten, and twenty neurons in those hidden layers works best. And we have trained. 20 neural networks and took the average of them for prediction. Now, we have the neural network 
trained and ready, we can deploy it to the actual GPS data to determine the thickness. And that's what I will talk now. So here we have the thickness predicted for the driving lane and driving lane shoulder of the I-40, where we performed the GPR. And we have also collected cores from this uh, location and made comparison with our back calculated thickness. So here you can see the field cores and the associated thickness and back calculated thickness. And we have also used radon to analyze the GPR data and determine the thickness. We can see that our back calculation method has a very high accuracy. The error percentage is 0.3% for the shoulder and 4.9% for the driving lane. On the contrary, radon has an error of around 17 to 19%. So why is that? This is because our method can consider both the dietic constant variation and the time information at the same time to predict the thickness inherently. It does not need any additional step, whereas uh, by default, radon does not consider those. You have to have some additional step to increased accuracy. Now once we have determined the thickness, I have already mentioned that our method can determine the variation in dietic constant. So here are the dietic constant variation for different uh, lifts in different location for driving lane and the driving lane shoulder. Here you can see that uh, the variation in dietic constant for each leaf is different for each of the locations. And uh, the dietic constant increases from top to the bottom lift. And there are some locations where the dietic constant are marked in red. These are the location of probable distress. And how did we define them? So any dietic constant if it is beyond plus minus one of the average value for that particular lift, we denote it to be the location of probable distress. And we have collected cores from those locations and we have found the evidence of presence of distresses. And these distresses vary from delamination, excessive voids to cracks. Now, one thing to mention over here as of this point, the developed methodology can only detect the location of probable distress, not the type of distress. Once we feel confident with the back calculated uh, method that we have developed, we have uh, deployed it into some other locations. One of the locations was on I-25 near Truth on Consequences in New Mexico, and another one was I-40 LTPP section. For the I-25 TRC location, the average uh, thickness that we have obtained has an error of around 3.5%. And from the dietic constant variation, we found that most of the distresses were found in the bottom lift. And when the cores were collected at those locations, we saw delamination in the bottom two lifts. And for the I-40 LTPP section, the thickness prediction error was again less than 5%, around 2%. And we did not observe any location of probable distresses from the dietic constant variation. And when we compared our prediction, with the LTPP reported core condition, we found that the core was reported to be in excellent condition. So it matched with our prediction as well. Now once we have the thickness and dialectic constant determined from the GPR, we can proceed with the development of a multi-scale finite element model. 
here are the steps that we have performed to develop this two-way coupled multi-scale finite element model. On the left-hand side, we have three input steps, and these input steps are associated with the generation of the micro model or the representative volume element. And once we have developed the micro model or representative volume element, we can combine it with the macro model or the actual pavement model to generate or develop our multi scale model. And we will validate the model. And after that, with the validated model, we will be performing some parametric study. So that's the outline. So let's start with the phase modulus determination of micro model through nano indentation test. So what is nano indentation test? So in nano indentation test, you have an indenter and you have the sample surface and you apply a small amount of load in the desired location of the sample surface, and you have a load displacement curve. And using that load displacement curve, you can determine the material property. So here is the black and white image of the sample surface where we perform the nano indentation test and how I determined this binary or black and white image I will talk about it in the next slide. But here, the black represents the mastic phase, and the white represents the aggregate. And we want the material property of these two phases to define our micromodel. Now, if we apply a small amount of load in this black phase or the mastic phase, we will have a load displacement curve, something like this. And this portion over here, this is the creep hold phase. And if we isolate it, we will have a displacement versus time graph shown over here. And this looks strikingly similar to creep compliance curve. So if we do some mathematical manipulation, we can determine the relaxation modulus from this displacement versus time graph. And that we can use for the material property of mastic phase. What about aggregate? We can perform a similar method of applying a small amount of load and obtaining the load displacement curve. And from the unloading phase of the load displacement curve, we can determine the modulus of aggregate phase. So now we have the material property for both the phases that we require. Next, we have to develop the micro model or the representative volume element itself. And for that, we have used image analysis. Here is the black and uh, here is the color image of the sample surface where we perform the test, the nano annotation test. And if we use thresholding and segmentation, we can convert this color image to the corresponding binary or black and white image. And this is the image that I have shown you in the earlier slides. So you have lots of smaller white aggregates, right? And these uh, smaller aggregates, if you use them directly, this image in the finite element program, you can do that. But if you use them, you can see in the finite element, the basic concept is you have to perform meshing. And if you mesh or divide this smaller aggregate, so they will have even further smaller elements, right? So when you apply load, they, they may deform excessively. And they will certainly have very bad aspect ratio, which generally throws analysis warning and sometimes even error. So we want to avoid those complications. For that, we have made some assumptions. And the assumptions is that any aggregate that are below 0.37 millimeter, we have removed them from analysis. 
and performing some morphological analysis we can get this image where the aggregates are represented with irregular shape and this is expected from the field sample but for better mesh control and the application of boundary condition what we did is we represented these irregular aggregates with regular polygons but keeping the area same for each aggregate and then we have to pad the surrounding and once we have done all these steps we have the model ready for the micro scale or the representative volume element ready and we can go ahead with the meshing and this is the meshed representative volume element or the RVE. Now one of the idea to do this multi-scale was to study the damage and fracture of the micro model from the load that we observe or we see in the actual pavement. So we not only want the response, that is the stress and strain of the micro model, we also want to study the damage and fracture. So if you want to study the damage and fracture, you have to have a damage and fracture model associated with the micro model. And for that, we have used phase field, uh, phase field fracture. So the beauty of phase field is that it can represent the sharp discontinuous crack with a diffusive damage which has a known width of uh, L0 and it's a scalar so it can take a value of 0 to 1, 0 means it's, uh, the, mat the material is fully intact and 1 means it's fully fractured. And this method is based on the energy minimization principle of Griffith. So if you want to study the nucleation, evolution, and propagation of the crack, you need to know the energy of the system. And as we know that asphalt concrete is the viscoelastic material, so we will need to have the elastic energy of the system, viscous energy of the system, and the fracture energy of the system. And there are explicit equations how you can determine them. Now, once you have these all the energy quantities, you can implement it in the multiscale model. But before we implement it in the multiscale model, we have to make sure that the phase field fracture is working accurately. And for that, we have simulated the semicircular bending test through phase field fracture. But before we simulate the semicircular bending test of uh, asphalt concrete through phase field fracture, we need some material property. And the material property are obtained from the indirect tensile test. And the fracture property are determined from the semicircular bending test or the SCB test itself. And from the unloading phase of the load displacement curve of the semicircular bending test, we can determine the degradation function required for the phase fill model. And these are the parameters that we have used for our simulation of semicircular bending test. So this is the semicircular bending test and that's what we will be simulating. Let's look at the model. So here is the model of semicircular bending test and we have used analytical rigid surface in the top and in the bottom to apply load and boundary condition. The load was applied from the top and the element size has to be uh, sufficiently small compared to the length scale of the phase field and we have considered three notch depths for the simulation of the SCB test and the load was applied with displacement control to mimic the laboratory condition. 
Now, once the simulation is conducted, this is the crack propagation path from the simulation, denoted in red. And this is the crack path that we have observed in the laboratory sample. Next, we looked into the load displacement curve from the simulation and the laboratory experiment. And we can see right off the bat, we do not have a good agreement between the simulation and the laboratory experiment. So we have to perform calibration. And performing calibration for fracture simulation of asphalt concrete is not unheard of. Past researchers have done that. So we have multiplied the fracture energy with a scalar value of 57. And once we do that, we can see for all the notch depths that we have considered, we have a good agreement between the simulated load displacement curve and the laboratory observed uh, load displacement curve. Now our phase field fracture model is ready. We can incorporate it with the micro model to study damage and fracture. So let's look into the multi-scale model development. We will be incorporating this micro model with the macro model, actual pavement model, to generate the multi-scale model. But before we do that, let's look at some of the concept, important concept of multi-scale modeling. And there are two concepts that are important localization and homogenization. What are these? So here you can see this is the actual pavement. And this is our macro model. And we assume that this macro model is comprised of these smaller representative volume elements, or micro model. There are a lot of asperities in the actual pavement. And we assume these all the asperities that we observe in the macro or actual pavement can be sufficiently represented in the micro model or the representative volume element RVE. And that is called localization. So what I just uh, explained can be better shown from this schematic. So here, Imagine this is your actual pavement, macro model. And you see there are a lot of asperities in it. And these asperities are features. It can be different phases, such as mastic and aggregate, presence of voids, fracture, you name it. So you have these asperities here in the macro model. And we assume that the macro model is a homogeneous one and all the asperities that are present in the macro model can be represented accurately in the micro model over here. And this macro model is comprised of lots of micro models. So if you apply a load on the actual pavement, some of this load will be transferred to the micro model. And we can perform the analysis on the micro model to get the response of the actual pavement through computational homogenization. Now, to have a micro model as representative volume element, we need to satisfy some criteria. And one of the criteria is separation of length scale. That is, the micro model this smaller model should be sufficiently small compared to the actual pavement model. However, it should not be so small that the laws of continuum mechanics does not hold. Now, once we have the model, uh, once we have understood the concept of uh, multiscale modeling, we can uh, develop it. And uh, as you can imagine, we have uh, two models, so we need to apply two boundary conditions. For the micro model, we have used periodic boundary condition, and we have used this equation to apply the periodic boundary condition. 
You may ask why periodic boundary condition asphalt concrete is not a periodic material. Past studies have shown that even for a non-periodic material, application of periodic boundary condition yields a good result for multi-scale modeling. So that's why we have used periodic boundary condition. And for the macro model, we have used axisymmetric 2D model where on the left hand side we have applied roller support so the model can move only in the vertical direction and the bottom was kept fixed. For the application of the load in the macro model we have used loading amplitude. So once we have developed the model we have to perform validation. For validation we have simulated the application of FWD 9 keep load on an instrumented pavement section. As we will be simulating the response of FWD on an instrumented pavement section, we will have pavement response not only from the FWD surface sensors but also from the embedded sensors. The instrumented pavement section where we performed the FWD had several embedded sensors. It has a strain gauge at the bottom of the asphalt concrete layer. It has earth pressure cells at top of base and subgrade. So the first, the top three, first row figure shows the comparison between simulated response and the actual pavement response for different uh, distance from the center of the FWD loading plate. And the bottom three figure shows the comparison of simulated response and the actual response from the embedded sensors. The first one is for a strain gauge at the bottom of the asphalt concrete layer. And the last two are the earth pressure cell response from top of base and top of subgrade. So Regardless of the sensor type, whether it is surface sensor or embedded sensor or the location of the sensor, we can see that we have a reasonably good agreement between the simulation and the actual pavement response. Now this slide shows the rationale behind performing the multi-scale modeling. So the first one is the actual pavement response and we have applied FWD on top of the pavement surface and we have seen the maximum strain occur at the bottom of the asphalt concrete layer and that strain value is 138 micro strain. This response and the responses that I have shown in the previous slide can be obtained from a traditional single scale model. So why do you need so much computational power and computational time to perform multi-scale modeling? The reason lies in this figure. So from the traditional single scale model, you just only get the value of 138 micro strain and that's what you, you generally use in the pavement design. But from multi-scale model, we also get the response of the representative volume element and the location where the maximum strain occurred has a representative volume element or RV associated with it. And from the macro to micro model, we see the strain increased from 138 micro strain to 487 micro strain, so 3.5 times increment. So, if this amount of load is coming to your pavement on a continual basis, at some point you will have some fatigue damage. But due to the high amount of strain, this fatigue damage or the micro fatigue damage will first initiate in this smaller representative volume element or the micro scale. And with time, these micro damages will coalesce together and will become macro damage and there you will have your bottom of fatty cracking initiation and with time they will reach top of the pavement surface and you will see it. So if you want, so if you, so for the design, if you want to avoid this micro damage and if you want your pavement to last for a longer period of time, 
we may need to consider this RV strain into the design. And we have simulated the application of FWD 9 tip load on an uh, instrumented pavement section that is located on an interstate highway and that application of a single FWD 9 tip load should not cause any damage to an interstate highway and that is what we are seeing from our simulation as well. If we did not observe any damage due to the application of a single FWD 9 tip. So now we have the pavement uh, multi scale model uh, uh, for the pavement ready. We have validated it. We have understood the concept. Now let's look into some parametric study. For parametric study, we have we have simulated the movement of super heavy loads, and we have considered the variation of unbound layer properties to study the damage in the asphalt concrete RV. And we have considered three cases. The case one, when the, when the asphalt concrete layer is the thickest, but the fracture energy is the lowest. Case two is opposite. We have the thinnest asphalt concrete layer, but highest fracture energy. And case three is in between. Now let's look at the effect of subgrade modulus variation on asphalt concrete RVE. And this is our control scenario for the three cases that we have considered. We have seen that when the subgrade modulus is 34.5 and the super heavy load moves through this uh, pavement, uniform damage of 1.2% occur for all the cases. However, when the subgrade modulus is reduced to 20.7 megapascal, we see the highest damage occur in the intermediate pavement. And when we increase the subgrade modulus to 48.3 megapascal, we saw that uh, there is a reduction of damage for all the cases considered. So we can say Reduction of subgrade modulus by 40% increases 52% more damage to the intermediate pavement compared to the control scenario. Now let's look into the effect of base modulus variation on asphalt concrete RVE. This is the control scenario. And when we reduce the base modulus from the control scenario by 50% to 103 megapascal, we see unlike the previous slide where we saw that most damage occurs in the intermediate pavement. This time around, we have the highest damage in the thinnest pavement. So 50% reduction in base modulus causes 1,200% more damage to the thinnest pavement compared to the control scenario. And if we look at the base thickness variation on the asphalt concrete RV, we see the similar trend. That is, in if we reduce the base thickness by 40%, 340% more damage is observed in the thinnest pavement compared to the control scenario. Now let's look at the conclusions based on these two topics. So, in the, so it can be said that uh, finite difference time domain and machine learning based back calculation algorithm can be developed to successfully determine the thickness and dietic constant from the GPR data. And we have seen that the developed back calculation algorithm has a uh, very high accuracy, the error ranges from uh, 0.3 to less than 5% for all the cases that we have considered. And the developed methodology has the potential to be implemented at the network level GPI data analysis, but before we do that, we have to train the model for various scenarios that it may encounter. And we can also say that nano orientation and morphological image analysis along with phase scale fracture can be implemented to develop a multi-scale model. And the responses that we can obtain from the multi-scale analysis, that is the RV strain,
can be significantly different than what we observe in the field or traditional single scale analysis. And if we want our pavement to survive a longer period of time, we may need to consider this RV strain into design. So that's all I have. And uh, I want to thank you all uh, for your interest in my presentation. If you have any question, I'd be happy to answer them. Back to you, Jerry. Okay. Thank you, Sample. Very interesting, extremely well delivered for a hugely complex topic. Uh, we'll get to the question and answer period, and we have a number of questions already, but if you've been focused on Zaffel's verbal description and the PowerPoint, sometimes it's difficult to formulate a question. Uh, I'd like to first tell you all about what's up and coming in the next few months relative to our monthly webinar series. Next slide, please. So uh, just as a reminder, if you had uh, been with us for a while or you're new to us in terms of ARA when, Webinar Wednesdays, all of our presenters are ARA employees. On December 20th, we have an early holiday gift for you presented by our colleague, Mr. John Donahue, uh, calibration making predictions to match pavement performance. You'll also note that we tend to, and we do this intentionally, vary from state of the art to state of practice presentations relative to uh, pavements and other types of infrastructure. We'll continue to do that. On January 31st, presented by Dr. Young Lee, we'll uh, see a new program for flexible pavement response under moving loads. Uh, and this is his lessons learned from our uh, departed colleague who left us too soon, Mr. Doug Steele. And then February 14th, uh, it's my turn, I guess. I'm going to try to do my best and share with you what I've learned from 51 years of practice. And my experience, as you well know, is more in heavy construction, geotechnical engineering, and foundation design. So stay tuned uh, for more ARA webinar Wednesdays. We've got programs booked now through the spring of 2024. Uh, by the way, February 14th program is going to be our five-year anniversary of initiating ARA Webinar Wednesdays. Now let's to get to Q&A. Next slide, please. So we've got a number of questions for Zaffel, and we may run out of time, as we often do. So I want to call your attention to Zaffel's email address. Uh, he's graciously agreed to answer questions for the next day or so. Please put your questions in the form of a technical request and not a consulting request. And also recognize that the intellectual property associated with some of the material presented today may kind of um, temper his responses. So please don't be offended if he's not completely able to answer your questions. So with that, the first question uh, that we have for you is Apple. This is from Kim, and Kim would like to know, did you only consider interstate pavements for the, the GPR data? Yeah, uh, for this study, uh, I have only considered the interstate highways. However, uh, as I have mentioned, that this uh, model has the ability to consider other pavement types as well, but uh, we have not done that for this study. Okay, then next question. Are there benefits for determining dielectric constants besides probable distress locations? Okay, so we have used the variation of dielectric constant in this study to identify the probable location of distresses, but it has some other benefits as well. The studies have shown that it is possible to correlate uh, the volume matrix of asphalt concrete with the uh, dielectric constant. So there are numerical uh, equations that can be developed. So uh, there are, uh, if we can develop such equations, uh, then we can definitely find the volume matrix directly from the GPR data. Okay. Uh, next question, and we're having some audio problems here. 
How did you determine the size of the RVE? So, uh, to determine the size of the RVE, we uh, we can perform a study similar to mesh sensitivity analysis. So, if you uh, you continue to change the RV size and monitor the response. And once you have a convergence in the response, you take that to be the size of your RVE. We have not done that for this analysis because past studies have shown that for asphalt concrete, an RV size of 50 to 60 millimeter is appropriate. And that's what we have used for this study, a 50 millimeter RV size. Okay, um, we do have a few more questions, but unfortunately we're almost out of time and we've got a few more things to cover. So I want to remind everybody, if you didn't, if we didn't get to your question or you think of a question following the conclusion of the program, please send Zaffel uh, an email of, of, during the next day or so and it'd be happy to respond to you. So on behalf of ARA, I want to thank you all for joining today and you're all entitled to receive uh, one hour PDH credit and we'll send you a certificate and also a PDH, uh, PDF version of today's presentation. Please allow three weeks to receive the certificate. Uh, we may post the PDF version a little quick, uh, quicker. If you have any questions, you see our ARA webinar Wednesday address here, please reach out to us. Uh, and remember, you have to be have participated in the entire one-hour program to be entitled to get the PDH certificate. More licensing boards than others are a bit more sensitive to that. So finally, uh, a commercial. ARA is a great company, Applied Research Associates. This I'm approaching my 10-year anniversary uh, with ARA, and I must say it's been an enjoyable experience. We're always looking for terrific people. We've got over 50 offices and over 2,000 employees from coast to coast and an office in Canada. And as you can see on this slide, we strive to hire value colleagues that have the right skills, but more importantly, have a passion for the core values of ARA, passion, freedom, service, and growth. And one of our mottos, similar to Alfred E. Newman, those of you know Mad Magazine, Alfred E. Newman, is engineering and science for fun and profit. If you're interested in employment opportunities with ARAs, transportation, and infrastructure offices, that's one of our four or five, that's one of our five or six business sectors, please send a brief resume to the address that you see here, www.joinara at ara.com. On behalf of today's presenter and everyone at ARA, I want to wish everybody a blessed and a joyous holiday season. We'll see you on December 20th. Mr. John Jonahue's program on pavement reality and comparing predictions with reality. Take care. Have a blessed day.